All right. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this event. Um, good. We have a pretty good turnout. Um, I'll just say a couple of words about uh, Alta Center for Entrepreneurship and then invite Jeff to the podium. Um, so Alta Center for Entrepreneurship, the organization I work for, we're the uh, umbrella organization for growth entrepreneurship in Alta. And more specifically, we focus on the technology transfer function in Alta University. And, um, uh, we also coordinate and organize and uh, fund uh, the commercialization of Alta technology. So annually, we fund uh, commercialization projects around uh, three to four million euros, and then we help either make them into a spin-out and or license. Um, yes, that's short for our days, but I'll let Jeff introduce himself. Thank you. Jeffrey Shanks. Um, Came all the way from San Francisco uh, on a couple flights earlier today. Um, so I apologize in advance if I'm slightly jet lagged. Oh, so where's my first line? A little bit of background of who I am. Um, I wrote my first patent application 15 years ago. I've written five or 600 since. Started off at a big firm, big law firm, um, for the first five or six years. Um, training there, and then I broke off and started my own. I've been now with my own law firm for 10 years, and what we do is we represent startups. Um, I work and live in the San Francisco Bay Area, and um, startups is what we do. This is what we live and breathe. In addition to representing startups, um, I also teach. I teach a class uh, at Stanford um, in the mechanical engineering department, uh, it's cross-listed over in the D School and also in uh, ms &E. And that class is uh, patent strategy uh, for um, innovators and entrepreneurs. I also teach a class over at uh, Stanford Law School. I've also taught at Stanford, or uh, University of Michigan in the College of Engineering there. Written a book, a bunch of blogs, a bunch of other things. But what I'm here today is to tell you about what startups need to know about patent law. It's just a tiny sampling of the clients that I have. Um, who here has heard of Twilio? A couple. Um, and there's Massive Health. Um, Tactus has gotten a lot of great press recently. Um, so companies, um, typically my background, uh, my background's in both mechanical and electrical and software. And so the companies that I represent are either kind of pure software plays, like platforms, like Twilio. Um, big cloud, big data in the cloud, um, but I also swing all the way to clean tech stuff and also to med device um, work as well. I don't do any pharmaceutical work or um, biotech, but there's a pretty decent range. Um, one, the biggest one that's not on there that it just landed a couple months ago is Facebook. I guess they're an exception to my rule that I only represent startups. Let's start with why do startups file patent applications? These are some great answers, or at least great answers that you would hear if you went and got a degree, um, an MBA, um, if you talk to a Fortune 500 um, company, a, a CEO or a CFO. These are the types of answers um, that they would give you. That this, this is why you would want to seek out a patent portfolio. All these are really bad answers for startups. To enforce uh, a patent against a competitor, this isn't going to work as a startup. And it's not going to work for a couple different reasons. One is that it takes too dang long. It takes three to five years to get an issued patent. And it also takes an enormous amount of money, something on the order of three to five million dollars to bring a lawsuit. We're hearing about the Apple and Samsung patent wars. These companies have billions of dollars to fight this thing out. This is the sport of kings. Um, patent infringement lawsuit, there isn't any type of lawsuit that's more expensive. You know it's a, an, an area that's ripe 
um, to making tons of money and is super expensive when you have private equity firms investing in uh, patent infringement lawsuits. And that's exactly what's happening in the United States. Prevent the patenting by someone else. And this is another example of you know, the, what you might hear. This doesn't make any sense either. Patents are going to cost somewhere on the order of 30, 35, 40 grand when they're all said and done. And this is just for one patent in one country. If you really want someone to prevent, if you want to prevent someone from patenting some certain technology, write a white paper. And make sure that the patent office knows about it. Put it in a journal that they actually search and search and they index. Make sure that when your competitors are going through with their own patent applications, you tell them about this. It's actually about that simple. A white paper and a couple of submissions that could run you maybe $500 as opposed to 30, 40, um, you know, or more grand to actually patent something. And generate licensing revenue. Um, tech transfer offices do this, um, IBM does this, Texas Instruments does this, and heck, they make billions of dollars doing this. Why can't we make a little bit of money off the side by licensing uh, our patents? The problem is, is that generating licensing revenue takes an enormous amount of time. And it takes someone probably, it takes at least one, if not several people, as a full-time job to be able to go out there track people down, show them prototypes, convince them of the market, and then negotiate that particular um, license. Honestly, it's easier to actually start a company and then to be acquired for the technology than it is to actually go license it. It's that difficult as a startup to try to, to, try to license your technology. <laughs> These are all the bad answers. So how do smart startups actually file patent applications? My favorite answer is to stimulate um, an investment or an acquisition. I often talk about uh, patents as like this big broad sword. It's this huge heavy sword. And they, you know, a company comes to me and they mined um, this new material and they bring it to me and I'm the blacksmith and I make this thing this huge sword and I'm hammering it down and make it super, super shiny, super sharp, but I can't lift it. And neither can my startup. It's too heavy for both of us. And so what we end up doing is just kind of putting it up on the wall. Neither the startup nor I could actually do anything with it other than put it up on the wall. It's not to say it's worthless. It's not particularly useful to us, but it's not worthless. In someone else's hands, that could be incredibly important. That could be a great weapon. Google could take that, pick it up with one hand, and slice off the head of Yahoo with it. They could do that because they have actually have an army of patent attorneys. And so the fact that you can't actually bring a lawsuit doesn't mean that you shouldn't actually get a patent. It just means that you're not going to be the one who brings the lawsuit. And that someone else is going to acquire you someday, and they're going to have that asset. They're going to have that patent, and they could do whatever they want with that. That's the acquisition side. From an investment side, um, valuable patents right now are going for about a million, million and a half. You put thirty or forty thousand dollars in, and you get one point five million dollars out. I mean, that's just like a printing, you know, money machine. You know, and if you had enough inventions, like you would just do this. Put thirty or forty thousand dollars in, and you get a million, million and a half out. This is why investors love it. But you have to do this at the right time. If you publicly disclose, um, or someone else beats you to the punch, then you can't actually get that million and a half out. It's zero. And so there's investors know that you have to be quick to do it, and that's why they want to be able to invest in companies that are doing this and have a very active patent portfolio. I like to tell the story of a client. Um, he called me on the phone one day, and he was way angrier than I've ever heard. Uh, we had very, very happy clients. Um, but this guy was just like, I need you to take me out to lunch, and I want to go out to lunch tomorrow, and it's got to be the fanciest place around. And so I didn't really know what was coming, but I knew that he wasn't happy. He just never spoke to me like that before. And we sat down, and it didn't take him long 
for him to just throw a spreadsheet down and say, do you realize that we spent $125,000 on protecting our patents over the last couple of years? And I don't know what we have for it. That 125 grand could really come in handy right now. We'd be able to you know, pay a little bit for marketing. We'd be able to hire another person. We'd be able to do all these different things. These are the things that we'd be able to actually move the company forward instead of just having this little thing like sit on the side. And I thought about it and I sat there and I smiled and I said, you know what? There's an 800 pound gorilla in your space. One that you're now starting to compete against and that particular company has taken notice. Why haven't they sued? So we actually know of a patent that this 800 pound gorilla has. And it looks like we infringe and we haven't been sued yet. Why is that? And he sat there and he thought about it and he thought about it and he's like, well, it's possible that you know, when they noticed us and they started pivoting towards what we were doing, that they knew that that was going to infringe the early patents that we filed. And you could see the light bulb kind of go off in his head, that he's like, oh, so the reason that we're still in business today is because we filed those patents, they were issued, and they turned around and tried to copy us. We knew that we didn't have enough money to sue them, but we knew that we infringed one of their patents. They haven't sued us, because we'd be able to turn around and counter suit. They knew that, and that's why they haven't brought a suit. And at that point, he looked at me and he smiled and he said, I got lunch, lunch is on me. <laughs> and it was a big deal because it was something where like, I can't measure this. I can't measure how often a lawsuit doesn't happen. I do find it a little strange that none of my clients have ever been sued. I've represented now 400 startup clients in the Bay Area. And you read all the time about patent trolls and patent lawsuits all the time, and not a single one of mine have been sued. It's possible that we build great patent portfolios that scare the heck out of larger companies from suing them. And this is a great reason to actually file patents. One of my other favorites is to increase leverage over a, a partner. Uh, the perfect example of this is you're signing a joint development agreement with Nokia and you're going to do that, you're going to start work on something together in three weeks. And you go out and you now have 21 days to file as many patent applications as you can because this is your technology. They're coming to you because of something that they want of yours. And then once that joint development agreement starts, it's now the collective you. You own it together, which is to say they could do whatever they want with it. But right now, you guys have something that's really special. That's why they're coming to you. And so if you turned around and protect it before that joint development agreement is signed, now you could turn around later on and say, yep, this thing went really well. Just want to make sure that we know when we split off and we go different directions that you're going to need a license to all of this technology basic technology that you've been using this whole time. So saved my clients at least three times that I could think of. Um, it wasn't Nokia, it was another company that's very similar. Um, in, in that particular case, we had filed eight provisional applications the day before the agreement was signed. And later on, when they decided to completely push out my client and say, we're gonna spin off this company, you're not gonna own any of it, you might be able to be a distributor to it, um, then we turned around and we reminded them that they needed this base technology of ours, which is why they came to us in the first place. Those eight provisional applications, we filed six of them into full patent applications, and we made sure that we filed them in Europe, and we, didn't, we went from 0% ownership to 33% ownership in the startup that went out the door. And it was simply because of that. Oftentimes, you don't have a lot of power and negotiation power with larger companies and larger partners, and this can definitely save the day. We've talked about why. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about when. When should startups file patents? There's kind of two answers here. And there's two answers because there's really two different types of patent systems in the world. There's everyone, and then there's the United States. 
And with respect to everyone in the world, except the United States, um, they have a first to file system. And in a first to file system, you need to file first, and you need to file before your public disclosure. It's just that, it's that simple. We are strangely moving towards a first to file system. That's gonna happen in March of 2013. Um, but it's not really a first to file system because we're still gonna retain a grace period. And the grace period that we have is as long as the inventor um, was the one who disclosed it, the inventor has 12 months in order to file. So this gets a little complicated on when. The really simple solution is file a provisional application in the United States before you launch. Provisional applications filed in the United States can be used later on as kind of the stepping stone for all other types of patent applications. Every other patent system in the world recognizes the US provisional as a filing date, an earlier filing date. And so anything that you file later would be considered to be filed on that earlier date of your provisional. Provisionals are just kind of like they sound. They're temporary, they're a little bit cheaper, they're a little bit easier. We charge five grand to write a provisional application, which isn't exactly cheap, but compared to 15 grand, which is what we write, charge to file a full patent application, it does seem at least a little bit more reasonable. At about the five grand mark, you get a, uh, a really good bang for your buck in terms of you want something that looks an awful lot like what your full application is going to look like, yet you still want to keep costs down and you want to move quickly. We could just slap a cover sheet on, you know, a PowerPoint presentation for free and file it, but a lot of countries in the world aren't going to recognize that and they're not going to give you that earlier date. And so we found that about the one-third effort mark, which corresponds to the one-third of price, is about the point in which you get a significant or solid provisional application. I'm going to try to answer the question of what is patentable. The easy answer is anything that you come up with that's new and not obvious. But that doesn't actually answer the question. And so I'm going to try to put a couple different buckets up here. And the buckets are in terms of maybe hardware and software. Maybe it's making, a method of making that hardware, or a method of using that software. And these are generally the types of things that can be patented. But from that, I want to move into this particular diagram. And this is all about abstraction layers. Abstraction layer is essentially the concept that this thing right here, what is this? What's that? It's a cup. It's a coffee cup. It's a, it's a container. Um, I like to call it my adult sippy cup because it doesn't, it doesn't leak. Um, Who's here a mechanical engineer that's put together a CAD file at some point? How big is the CAD file if you're gonna take this and ship it off to China and have it come back exactly like this? Same color, same texture, same spring loaded, everything. How big is that CAD file? Pretty big. Just a wild guess. Two gigabytes? Maybe. Okay, great. So I can describe this in two words. Um, sippy cup or maybe um, drink container. And I could also describe the same thing in two gigabytes. Right? Same thing. I'm pointing the same thing. It could be described in two words or two gigabytes. And for those that don't know gigabytes, it's a lot. I mean, that's just a lot of words. Isn't it? I mean, that, so this is a very, very important first step. And the media gets this thing wrong all the time. When you're talking about inventions, and you're talking about them at the super high level, at this very, really broad concept layer, it's never going to be patentable. A while ago, when Amazon patented the one click, that's what the media said. They patented one click. How could that possibly be? Haven't we all clicked a button once before? How could Amazon click? How could they protect one click? It wasn't really just one click. It wasn't just those two words that Amazon had protected. Um, the patent office knew that. Amazon knew that. 
It was this combination of moving information back and forth from a server, being able to um, wait for a particular type of response after displaying things, and be able to process this, accessing a cookie, and then going through with a transaction. It was about 200 words that they actually protected. The code may have been 20,000, 200,000, 2 million lines of code. But there's an abstraction layer in there. It would have been great had they just got one click, then every single time anyone clicks one button, then they'd be able to sue them. But that's not what they actually got. They got something that was a little bit different, a little bit more narrow than that. Imagine if Amazon had the, a patent on all, let's just say, 200,000 lines of code for one click. Would that be valuable? Why not? What's that? Yeah, I mean, you could, you could just change a, one of the lines, right? I mean, 200,000 is a lot. Like, you would just change one line, and then you wouldn't infringe anymore. But my guess is that no one's ever done 200,000 lines just like that before. And so maybe it's patentable. And this is what I'm trying to show over here. But you could take just about anything and say, this is patentable. And you could say, the same exact thing, it's not patentable. And you could say that patent would be incredibly valuable. And you could say that patent would be absolutely worthless. And yet I'm talking about the same thing. And so when people talk about this in generality of like, well, patents are useless, they're talking about one particular end of this particular abstraction layer. And when they talk about it as this is the most valuable thing that we own, they're talking about it within a particular abstraction layer. And when we say that there's no way that that thing is patentable, they're talking about one abstraction layer. And when they say that this is, this is for sure patentable, again, they're talking about one particular abstraction layer. Turns out that inventions, the ones that you actually protect at the patent office, are somewhere around 150 to 400 words. It's not two. It's not two billion. It's about 200. And at that particular level, you start to get at things that no one's ever been done, no one's ever done before. And at that same exact level, you're, at, you're playing in a field where now you'll be able to protect something um, and people won't be able to make a small modification. It's a top four container, including an orifice um, and a spring-loaded seal. A cantilever goes across the orifice, um, you know, uh, actuatable by a thumb, to depress the seal and to be able to allow fluid in. The default um, state of that particular spring is up, and so that any other fluid um, that, when it's being tilted, pushes up against it and doesn't leak out. I wasn't counting, it's hard to count and kind of create a quasi-claim at the same time in front of um, 80 people, but that was probably somewhere around 200 words, give or take. And at that point right there, that's something that's really valuable that this particular company could have gotten. Could they have made, could a competitor have made a, a little change? Well, they could have made a major change, but it would be a different change, it would be a different design. At that particular layer, which is that middle piece right there. That's gonna be something that's patentable. Have you seen this before? Has anyone ever done this before? Probably not. This thing is probably patentable at that abstraction layer. And it's probably very valuable at that abstraction layer. And this right here is the key to understanding what is patentable. Just pick up just about anything, any gadget that you own. And you can think of it in terms of like, oh, sippy cup not patentable. Oh, two gigabyte CAD file, very patentable. Sippy cup, that'd be awesome to have if I would be able to protect that. Two gigabytes, pretty worthless. But there's an abstraction layer in between that that's where patent attorneys play and that's where we're trying to find those 200 words that make it so that it's very valuable and very patentable. And that's what we call invention. Need to talk a little bit about the biggest misunderstanding about patent law. And the biggest misunderstanding about patent law revolves around this relationship between the patentability of an invention 
and the infringement of another patent. And the best way that I could explain this is with a little example. On the left, we have a great American inventor. This is the light bulb. And Edison was awarded a patent for the light bulb. On the right side is another great American um, inventor. You probably haven't heard of him. I hadn't heard of him. Um, by the name of Pipkin. Most of the bulbs in this room are frosted. My guess is most of the bulbs in your house are frosted. Most of the bulbs in your office are frosted. Like this was a big deal. Pipkin improved upon Edison's light bulb in a major, major way. In a way that actually touches our lives every single day. Multiple, multiple times. My guess would be hundreds of times a day. Who can make a frosted light bulb? Edison or Pipkin? Let me put this another way. Say I'm Pipkin. I've been working really hard in my lab for a while. Finally figured it out. Perfected a way to frost light bulbs. Talked to a patent attorney, took a little equity stake in my company, filed the patent. It issued just yesterday. Would you invest in my company? It's going to be huge. 80% of all light bulbs are going to be frosted. You got three seconds to decide. Took too long. Are you going to infringe in my patent? Are you, you're not going to invest? You will invest. Great. Who else will invest? Pipkin. What's this? You kind of invest? What do you want? Options? <laughs> Edison was a pioneer. And he had a pioneering invention. He had a patent out there, and that patent was an incredibly broad patent. It was effectively the light bulb. I mean, it's the thing that like, you know, goes off in the top of your head. I mean, that's how big of an idea it was. It literally went on over his head. Um, Pipkin was an improvement. He built upon that. He took someone else's idea and said, all right, let's make this thing better. We're going to look down on these two cylinders. And when we look down on these two cylinders, we got um, Edison's huge land. And now we have Pipkin's smaller land inside of it. To build and make a frosted light bulb, you need to stand right in the middle of that. And to get in there, there's two fences around that. There's a black fence in which Edison has a key, and there's a red fence that Pipkin has a key. Edison could go right on through the black fence, but he's stuck when he hits the red fence. Pipkin can't even get in the black fence. He's fine if he could get through there, but he can't even get in. What happens? What's going on here? They have to cooperate. What does that mean? Neither one of them can actually make a frosted light bulb. Edison could stop Pipkin, and Pipkin can stop Edison. And what happens in these types of situations is a cross-licensing deal. Pipkin could turn to Edison and say, you know what? You figured this out. You know, you're killing it in the market space. Like, you got this great brand thing going on. And like, um, just give me a quarter every single time you make a frosted light bulb. And Pipkin's probably going to be like, yeah, this is awesome. I'll take that. Or Edison might say, you know what, Pipkin, I don't really believe that this frosted light bulb thing is going to um, take off. I'm pretty sure I perfected it. But if you want to go out there and try, just give me 50 cents every single time that you make a light bulb, um, and I'll give you those rights. Or maybe Westinghouse comes along and grabs rights from, from Pipkin and rights from Edison. I usually have my iPhone in my pocket, and this is usually when I pull it out. Um, so pretend right here, this is my iPhone. How many patents are on this iPhone right now? 
Is it more than one? Yeah. Is it more than 10? Yeah. Is it more than 100? Yeah. Is it more than 1,000? Is it about 5,000? <laughs> yes. It's about 5,000 patents and a device that I usually have in my pocket. How is that possible? Apple doesn't own all 5,000. And it's not equally split between Apple and Samsung either. <laughs> Although the media would like you to believe that, but that's not actually the case. Um, there are hundreds, thousands of companies that have patents on things that are necessary to make that iPhone happen. And Apple pays, and Samsung pays, and we pay, and sometimes nothing gets paid, and sometimes no one even gets noticed, and sometimes things are paid for things that even shouldn't be paid on. But these things are actually a part of being a successful business. One of my clients was talking about, like, well, so I, I loathe the day when we're going to be sued by a patent troll. And I said, actually, as an investor, I'm super excited about that. And he just looked at me like, what do you mean? And I'm like, well, that means that you're an incredibly successful company. And that you're making somewhere on the order of about $100 million a year in revenue. I told you earlier how much expensive it was to actually bring a patent infringement lawsuit on the order of about three to five million. Now you're not gonna bring, you're not gonna spend three to five million unless you know there's a good, good chance that you're gonna make at least 10. And 10 is a reasonable royalty of 10% off $100 million in revenue. And so unless you're a $100 million in revenue company, you're typically not gonna get sued. Unless it's by a direct competitor and it's perfect timing because you're starting to run out of money and you're about to raise um, a big round from Sequoia and then your competitor just steps in and just squashes you. That's an awesome strategy, by the way. Um, but, and that does happen over and over and over again in uh, Silicon Valley. Not to my clients yet. So we're going to go back to the biggest misunderstanding about patent law. Invention can be patentable uh, if it can be distinguished from previous inventions. A product may infringe if an existing patent it may infringe an existing patent if it contains all the elements of a claim. <coughs> I don't have the time to go into the huge matrix, but I can prove to you that these two things are completely independent of each other. And just really quickly, I could say it doesn't really matter if Pippin actually had patents. It would still infringe that particular Edison's light bulb. And so think about like in terms of like it didn't really matter. And it didn't actually matter if Edison was there on the patentability of Pipkin's uh, invention. These two things don't have anything to do with each other. Oftentimes when, you, when someone says like I have a patent on it, you think that they could actually make it. And that's not the case. We've been kind of building up to this point the whole time. Um, what do investors want to hear when they talk about intellectual property? I just said there's those two things, patentability and infringement, don't have anything to do with each, with each other. And so when they ask you about intellectual property, they're going to want to know about two different things. They're going to want to know, do you have something that's protectable? Do we have an asset that's going to turn out to be worth a couple million dollars some year, someday? Do we have something that is going to deter others from suing us? Do we have something that's going to keep us in good shape when we're moving into strategic partnerships with very, very large companies? The other t set of questions the one over here is, if you build this and make it, are you going to be sued? Sometimes called clearance, that's sometimes called freedom to operate, abbreviated just simply FTO. In the med device world, it is absolutely huge. It's paramount. Like you can't raise $250,000 without getting an FTO. That's a big deal. In the software world, it's almost on the complete other end of the spectrum. I've seen companies raise C, raise C, A, and B before they were asked, hey, are you infringing any patents that are out there? I think one of the reasons that it's, that is the case is because software is a lot less capital intensive. And you could turn around and just change it. But in a med device company, especially one that you're then building something and submitting to the FDA and you've already gone through a bunch of clinical trials, it's really hard to change that design. 
It's incredibly expensive and I wasted a bunch of time. And so that's why it's really important from an FDO uh, perspective, the amount of time that goes into it or a capital that goes into it. That FTO is gonna become more and more important. Again, on the software side, not as much. But there are eight million patents out there. I'm not recommending that you look at all eight million. It'll take you a while. And then plus, there's another 5,000 that issue on Tuesday, another 5,000 that issue the next Tuesday, and another five that issue. And this is just the United States. If you actually want to you know, look at um, the EU and China and Japan, it's going to take you a while. I would, however, regardless of whether you're a med device or a software, make sure that you think about what are your competitors doing. And are your competitors, do they have something exactly on this? Those are the ones that are going to shut you down. Those are the ones that are going to say, yeah, we just raised $10 million. Let's spend a million of that to get rid of this competitor. Because this competitor is about to raise $20 million, and then they're going to just put us out of business. So let's slap a cease and desist right on top of them, right in the middle of their round, and it's pretty much gone. Like a little atom bomb, like right on top. I'm not recommending doing that to others, but I am recommending making sure that doesn't happen to you. It's not that hard, especially if you're in software, to be able to design around. It's not that hard to be able to turn, go back to the patent office and say, you didn't do a very good job with this one. You shouldn't have issued this particular patent. We know of all of these other things, and we're going to submit it to your patent office, and we'd like you to re-examine it. It costs about 15 grand, and it might save your company. Got all the important stuff out of the way. Um, I'll tell you how to choose a patent attorney. Startup patent attorneys have to play in kind of these three different worlds, which is actually the unique position that allows me to give a talk later on this week. Um, I straddle the legal world, the business world, and the technology world. From a legal standpoint, uh, the Supreme Court has said flat out Patent applications, and specifically claims, are the hardest document, legal document there is, period. It's an art form that takes many years to actually get down right, to be able to do, to be able to put in 200 words what exactly this invention is. I didn't do it so eloquently earlier. Um, but to be able to pick those exact 200 words, not one too many and not one too few, and exactly those exact words. It's been several cases that I've read over the last couple of years that have turned on a prepositional phrase. Like it's a really big deal to get every single word right. From a technology standpoint, you want a patent attorney to be able to, to get your technology. You want someone to be able to brainstorm with and be able to bounce ideas off of. You're gonna to come to them with a product. And what their job is, is to find the invention. What well, could you do it this way? What if you did it this way? Isn't it really something a lot bigger than this? And your, your gut instinct is to say, look, we've been at this now for six months. I know what the product is. I know what the invention is. It's this thing right here. But it's a patent attorney's job to be able to push that and to be able to say, let's figure out what the invention is. You're, show you're showing up with the two gig file and we need to get to the 200 word version. And lastly, business. Patent attorney needs to act as your quasi in-house patent counsel, which is a big phrase to be able to say, they need to be the ones that actually develop your patent strategy. Someone needs to be sitting there between the CEO, the CFO, and the CTO and be able to say, hey, we should be able to protect this. We should protect it in this market. Let's file a provisional application on this. Let's split that provisional into these two. Let's file a divisional over here. Let's make sure that we file a PCT and be able to hit these other countries over here. The CTO doesn't typically have the time or the brain power to do that. The CEO certainly doesn't. And so this is something where um, early stage patent attorneys play that particular role. And so make sure that you actually work with someone who has that experience. I'm sure there's great, great patent attorneys that have worked with Nokia for a long time. And they're right here. And it doesn't mean to be offensive, but there's no way that they're going to give you great um, advice when it comes to startups. Because I've been there, and I've done that particular work. I've done Fortune 50 work before, 
and it is completely opposite of startup work. Literally, the exact situations you would go one way with a Fortune 50 company and the exact opposite way with a startup. Make sure that the person that you're working with has worked with startups before. That's what I have. Happy to um, stand around for a while answering um, questions if you have any. Questions? Go for it. Uh, yeah, I was going back to this example of, for example, the light bulb. And, uh, Hello? Okay. Yeah, going back to this example of the light bulb. Okay, so Edison's got this patent for light bulb, and Pippin, or whatever his face was, once has frosted light bulbs. Now, can Pippin? buy from the market Edison's light bulbs and then frost them and then sell them as frosted light bulbs. Is yep. he allowed to do that? Yep, so this is called the first sale doctrine. I'm not um, a European patent attorney, so I can't say that this is uh, worldwide law. Um, but from my understanding, this, there's similar laws throughout the world, um, and this is called the first sale doctrine. I bought something, I paid full price for it, and now I'm gonna do something else. There are some products that actually have what's called like a shrink wrap around it. And that shrink wrap is like, you're only going to be able to use it in this way. It's a one-time use only. You've just probably seen this and just kind of rip right by it. Um, but in those types of situations, you're supposedly agreeing with the owner of the technology to a license and be able to say, all right, this is how I'm going to use this. As long as that's not the case, you could do whatever you want with that. What would you say to the startups like, okay, what Facebook was in its beginning when it didn't patent almost at all, or Google? Or, yeah. Google was in its beginning in the 90s where, well, there were almost no zero, zero patents owned by the firm. And uh, do you say to them, okay, fine, sooner or later you need, a, say, portfolio of them? Because many startups, uh, maybe or either they don't want to patent because of the costs or, or other reasons, or uh, then they kind of uh, despise patents sure. for various reasons. What would uh, you say to them? I have plenty of clients that despise patents. Um, it's an asset. Yeah. You know, like you need to have a bathroom, you know, in the building. You know, like you need to have like certain assets. You need to have like certain things to be able to move your company forward. And we don't necessarily want to pay for all of those. We don't want to pay for taxes early on. We don't want to do workers' comp early on. There's a whole bunch of things that we don't want to do. This is something that, unlike all those other silly examples that I just gave, can actually grow to something to be worth a heck of a lot. Um, Google was actually formed on patents, um, page rank. Um, back rub, as it was originally, originally called, um, was Larry and Sergey at Stanford. Stanford actually owns that patent, and they license it to Google. Um, Google did a decent job building a patent portfolio over time, and then they just went hog crazy, and then they went really crazy when they bought Motorola and they bought 17,000 um, patents. Um, Facebook recently bought a thousand patents from IBM for a billion dollars. You know, so there are companies out there that are swapping, and um, AOL swapping um, patents for a billion dollars. And Microsoft and um, Nortel and Kodak swapping patents for a billion dollars. And so these companies are trying desperately to build up this patent portfolio so that they could essentially have enough warheads in the mutually assured destruction model. Because um, if you don't have enough warheads, then it doesn't work. Um, and so what I recommend is not going out, um, I don't recommend startups go out and spend a billion dollars buying a thousand patents. I don't recommend that. Um, but it may make sense to file one or two on your core technology. What I do and what I do best is actually scale patent portfolios. Like th that's like the core of what I personally do. 
I mean, there are plenty of people that write patent applications, but like to try to figure out, okay, where are we on this curve, and how do we make sure that we have just the right amount at just the right time? Because what we want is to be able to have a great patent portfolio at the end, but we certainly can't afford that now. And so how do we delay costs? How do we push things into the future? Those types of things, that's exactly what I'm really good at. And so that's the kind of stuff that um, typically Fortune 500 company um, patent strategies, like they just skip right over provisionals because it costs extra money. But they're not thinking about like the being able to delay and how much different your company is going to be in 12 months. Hi there. That was terrific. Really fabulous. Thanks, Thank you. Um, I have a very specific question. When you were talking about your cup and the um, patent that you would write for it, the way you described it was that the default position was closed. And the reason I ask this, if somebody were to invent something and had everything the same but the default position was open, would that infringe or not? I mean, how much you know, is that the sort of thing that you spend a lot of time sort of trying to fill all of those holes so that somebody couldn't? Or, I mean, so how broad can you write it so that's, that... So that's the, the trick. Um, I would love to be able to just write sippy cup, period. Um, because then it would just be the broadest thing. But we need to get it through the patent office. And we need to get it through the patent office, which means the patent office is going to turn on and be like, yeah, I already found a sippy cup. Be like, oh, no, no, we got a sippy cup with a um, lever on it. Yeah, yeah, we found one of those too. I'm like, oh, no, no, we found a sippy cup with a lever and um, it's you know, a circular you know, seal. Yeah, yeah, we found that too. And so we need to go in there at a point where it's like, all right, here's enough that we're going to have a good fight over this one of like what is really a circular seal and what is really a default and what is really a you know, tension spring and things like that. We're going to have a good fight over like, some of those details. But yes, it comes down to that. And if you make a change like that, you don't infringe. And that's exactly why every single word is so important in a claim. Hi, uh, quick question. What happens if you file an application and it takes you know, a few years for it to be either rejected or accepted, and then somebody else starts producing that stuff? What can you do? Well, this is either great news or it's terrible news. Um, if you end up getting an issued patent and you now have some money or you could convince some other investors to go after this other company because they're doing really well, then great. You have an asset that someone else infringes. Um, but if you haven't really raised any money um, or you can't really attract any investors to go after that particular person, then um, that's bad news um, because it's really expensive. And so this type of thing happens all the time. There are no patent police. Um, there's no one that you could go complain to. Um, you have to actually go to a judge and you have to say like, all right, I'm gonna file a lawsuit. And all of that is incredibly expensive. You don't have patent rights until they issue. In the United States, you have retroactive patent rights if it issues. And you could go back to the publication date and say, on this date forward, I want uh, reasonable royalty. And so you can get some damages there. Thank you. Yep. Hi. Uh, how patents are usually uh, evaluated in bootkeeping uh, within startups? I mean, those can be worthless or those can be very valuable. Yeah, I get this question a lot. Like, how do you put a value on that patent? How do you put a value on that asset? Yeah. Um, I know of at least seven different ways to value a patent, um, and I'm pretty sure I only know like a very small fraction of that. Um, when it comes down to it, um, the person who's going to pay the most has the most painful position um, behind that patent. You know, this is something like a Samsung um, that's being sued for a billion dollars. Um, those patents are going to be worth somewhere on the order of $999 million, right? because that's a little bit cheaper than a billion. Yeah. And so like those patents are worth a heck of a lot. Um, but you could also turn around and say like, you know, that's, they're just pieces of paper. Um, this thing is worthless. And so one way of valuing it is just the money that actually went into it. 
uh, that like, all right, we spent you know, 30 grand you know, filing this or trying to get this through the patent office. That's one way. Another way is like trying to capture the kind of this R&D aspect. But there's a ton of different ways, even in the United States. I certainly am not an expert on how um, that accounting aspect's done here in Europe. But all of those are more or less valid if you read just it by them. Yeah, I mean, so it's, you, you have the technology, you have those trade secrets. How do you put trade secrets on the books? Mm -hmm. And trade secrets are often more valuable than patents. Yeah, indeed. And yet, how do you put those on the books? You don't typically put them on the books. But you cannot really put them there if you don't have someone willing to buy your company or something like that. So it's an asset that doesn't really have a price. There's no good market. Yeah, yeah there's no good market for it. Indeed. There's been a couple of attempts at creating markets for patents. Um, they haven't done so well. And a lot of it has to do with, um, it's very difficult to figure out um, what a patent covers and what can be designed around and who, are the, who else is already infringing. Um, typically, those types of markets just kind of end up collapsing into, okay, who needs a patent because you're being sued and you want to sue someone back in cross-licensing? Yeah. That's usually what those markets collapse into. Okay, is there any, I mean, in common practice, if I have one patent, owned by my company, so is it worth uh, 100,000 euros by default if there is no other information? I mean, of course you... I, I, I don't, I simply just don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I think that there's, a, there's different ways of putting values on it. Yeah. And from a startup perspective, I don't know if you actually do want to put a value on it. Um, I think that um, when you're raising money, you can just kind of say, look, we filed patents, this is why we're getting the valuation that we're asking for. But when you do the whole hand-waving thing anyways, when trying to get a valuation, I mean, there's a whole lot of, plenty of other factors that are being kind of fudged around. Okay, thanks. Yep. So you, you concentrated primarily today on, on patents. Um, what do you think about um, the use of other forms of intellectual property, such as copyright, design, registration, trademark? For startups, they seem to be, for me, uh, something easier to get and maybe to defend. Um, potentially easier to get, um, potentially easier to defend, but nowhere close to the kind of impact if you have a great, you know, broad patent. Um, you know, if you've come up with a clever name and you have a lot of users, then that's great. You know, Skype, like people know what that is and people are drawn to that. And then you Skype your friends or you Skype your parents. Like it's turned into a, you know, a verb. And so those are great trademarks and that's gonna add a ton of value there. Uh, it takes a really long time to get to that point. You know, to get to the point where a trademark is actually has an incredible amount of value. And so, I mean, that, that's there. Copyrights are automatic. Um, so you put something down on paper, you save it to a disc, um, any kind of tangible um, recording of any kind of code or anything, um, and you have a copyright in that. And so copyrights are great against piracy. Copyright, right to copy. You know, like, do you have the right to copy? And so, like, that is what a copyright is. And so it, they're great against piracy in terms of, like, pure piracy, as in, like, someone took the exact code of your website and then just duplicated it. Um, it, they don't work very well, though, if you make a bunch of changes, because that's not really a copy anymore. And so there's some advantages and disadvantages to copyright and to trademark. Um, trade secret is something which works really well in certain situations. Um, we have a manufacturing process. Um, we're not going to tell anyone about it. We don't want to put it in a patent because the patent's going to publish, and we're not going to know whether or not our competitors are actually manufacturing their products using this method. That's a trade secret. You don't want to patent that. And that could be the most valuable thing that you have. But in the case of, for example, um, uh, Amazon with the one click, okay, the algorithms are one thing, but the, the one click is also, is that a trademark or is that what? I bet you there's a, a trademark around that, um, but they all license, you know, all the different companies that now offer one click checkout have all licensed that patent from Amazon. <clears throat> yeah, so it was the patent that was the underlying thing. You did ask about design patents um, or design registrations. I mean, obviously, you know, the folks in the room probably heard 
the Apple Samsung case and Apple you know, patented the rounded corners, um, which seems absurd. They didn't do it in a utility patent application, they did it in design. And so they had a tablet, actually it was the phone version, that had you know, a particular shape. And that was a big deal. That was one of the patents that they were successful on recently um, in the Apple v. Samsung case. And so there's certain times where, great, but again, it's kind of like a trademark. Like, I mean, you want to be at a point where everyone knows what you're doing, and at that point, intellectual property is relatively cheap anyways. And so if you're looking at it that like, okay, these things are cheap, we could do these instead of patents, you're probably too early to be able to have, make those things be valuable. Yeah. Hey, uh, thanks for the great talk, by the way. Um, I guess normally when you work with startups and their patents, they're most likely to be patent applications, right? They're not, they haven't been granted yet. Correct. And at the beginning you said that, you know, maybe one of the most, you know, <coughs> important reason for, for startups to apply patents is that it stimulates investments. So from investor point of view, do you see that you know, the patent application already you know, is, is you know, good enough, right? Yes, um, they're not waiting around for an issued patent. Um, you know, especially in the United States right now, it's taking forever. Um, it is getting significantly better and we now have a fast track option, uh, but generally it's still taking way too long. Um, I've seen investors um, not only give full credit to a patent application, but full credit to a provisional patent application. And be able to say, I understand where this is going. This is really well written. You have a cohesive strategy. I understand how the different technologies are going to fit into your patent portfolio. What we typically do during due diligence is kind of create a graphic of like here are the different features or different aspects of the technology, and this is how we plan on protecting them over the years, and this is how we're scaling the patent portfolio. And that typically it was just, you know, investors don't have enough time to actually read patents anyways, and so they see this pretty graphic and they're like, yeah, this is great. And that's usually enough. Thanks. So you're a full-time patent attorney, but you say you also teach courses. Why do you teach courses in entrepreneurship and patent law? So when I left my big firm, um, that was back in 02, a three time frame. Um, when I did that, I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do. Um, and so I went back and got a master's degree. Um, I took a teaching position at the University of Michigan, which that was really strange to be able to teach and take classes in the same department. They didn't know what to do with me um, because I was not like a teaching assistant or a lecturer, like I was a full on professor. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, and then also started my firm. And I honestly just kind of threw all of those up in kind of like this iterative, you know, startup way of just like, I don't know what's gonna work, but I'm just gonna try this. And it turned out that it worked really well. Um, because I'm not at a big firm, I need other brains to be able to bounce ideas off of, to be able to say and push me in terms of being, our, being able to articulate. I work with startups, which means typically engineers and entrepreneurs. And I need to learn that language. I need to be able to teach at that particular level. Um, I don't typically come off as a lawyer, um, and I actually like that, um, and my clients like that. And so like being able to teach is actually incredibly important. I also be able, I'm able to recruit some great people and be able to recruit against you know, companies that are in firms that are much, much bigger than, than I am. And I usually take my brightest student and bring them in as, a, as my protege for the next couple of years. And so there's this wonderful thing that's kind of happening with kind of the teaching and the writing and the law firm that I do. All right. Okay, one more? Yeah, so let's take this one more question and then we're out of time. Yeah. I'll make the final one. I'll make the final one. So how do you basically make Google buy a pattern? Because, for example, in software business, you mentioned that mostly it's workarounds. So how, you know, original, how legible you have to be for, for not to get wasted, but to get basically bought? Yeah, no, great question. Um, I've been working on that for a while. Um, I have a client that um, acquired a couple, a small patent portfolio, a couple of brilliant folks that came out of the University of Michigan, and um, on like uh, visual search, and this is years ago, like 12 years ago, great patents on it, and trying to put together a couple of deals. And when you approach a company, um, essentially, 
and through goodwill of just like, hey, I have these things, I think you should buy them, they don't really care. They have so many other things that are on fire that they don't really care about the, like, the nice guy that's trying to walk in the door to try to sell them something. They, it honestly like, just doesn't even register. And I had a great in like, all the way up to the top and like, they still, I couldn't get the right person at the right time of day. And so we've actually taken a different approach and said, all right, fine, like, we've done the nice guy approach thing, like it didn't work. And so now we're going to a couple of competitors and being able to see if, you know, and having a very short auction type time frame. You know, here's what it is, and you got two months to decide, and we're happy to provide any due diligence materials you have. At the end of those two months, you know, you need to make a decision. And hopefully with that particular data, we can now turn around and go back to Google and say, this was the deal we were trying to sell you, you know, six months ago. The cost has now quintupled. I'm really sorry about that, but you know, you didn't pay attention the first time that I came in, you know, as a nice guy. And so unfortunately, you need to be able to raise the stakes so that they could actually hear you. That's the approach, that's a direct, like, buy my patents approach. The other approach, which I actually think is way more, um, I'm not gonna call it easy, um, but there's a better chance of success is to be acquired. To be able to say, look, we have an amazing team, we have an amazing product, uh, we're willing to, you know, to move and to be right there in Palo Alto, and we're gonna be able to do these things like within Google, and oh, by the way, we have five patents on this technology that I'm sure is really gonna fit nicely into your patent portfolio. And that right there is a nice combo. And with those five patents, maybe you've added another five million onto that valuation. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, it's been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you. <laughs> Prevent the patenting by someone else. And this is another example of you know, the, what you might hear this doesn't make any sense either. Patents are gonna cost somewhere on the order of 30, 35, 40 grand when they're all said and done. And this is just for one patent in one country. If you really want someone to prevent, if you want to prevent someone from patenting some certain technology, write a white paper. And make sure that the patent office knows about it. Put it in a journal that they actually search and search and they index. Make sure that when your competitors are going through with their own patent applications, you tell them about this. It's actually about that simple. A white paper and a couple of submissions that could run you maybe $500, as opposed to 30, 40, um, you know, or more grand to actually patent something. And generate licensing revenue. Um, tech transfer offices do this, um, IBM does this, Texas Instruments does this, and heck, they make billions of dollars doing this. Why can't we make a little bit of money off the side by licensing uh, our patents? The problem is, is that generating licensing revenue takes an enormous amount of time. And it takes someone probably, it takes at least one, if not several people, as a full-time job to be able to go out there track people down, show them prototypes, convince them of the market, and then negotiate that particular um, license. Honestly, it's easier to actually start a company and then to be acquired for the technology than it is to actually go license it. It's that difficult as a startup to try to, to, try to license your technology. So these are all the bad answers. So why do smart startups actually file patent applications? <laughs> My favorite answer is to stimulate um, an investment or an acquisition. I often talk about uh, patents as like this big broad sword. There's this huge heavy sword. And they, you know, a company comes to me and they've mined um, this new material and they bring it to me and I'm the blacksmith and I make this thing, this huge sword and I'm hammering it down and make it super, super shiny, super sharp, but I can't lift it. And neither can my startup. It's too heavy for both of us. And so what we end up doing is just kind of putting it up on the wall. Neither the startup nor I could actually do anything with it other than put it up on the wall. It's not to say it's worthless. It's not particularly useful to us, but it's not worthless. In someone else's hands, that could be incredibly important. That could be a great weapon. Google could take that, pick it up with one hand, and slice off the head of Yahoo with it. They could do that because they have actually have an army of patent attorneys. 
And so the fact that you can't actually bring a lawsuit doesn't mean that you shouldn't actually get a patent. It just means that you're not going to be the one who brings the lawsuit. And that someone else is going to acquire you someday, and they're going to have that asset. They're going to have that patent, and they could do whatever they want with that. That's the acquisition side. From an investment side, then. All right. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this event. Um, good. We have a pretty good turnout. Um, I'll just say a couple of words about uh, Alta Center for Entrepreneurship and then invite Jeff to the podium. Um, so Alta Center for Entrepreneurship, the organization I work for, we're the uh, umbrella organization for growth entrepreneurship in Alta. And more specifically, we focus on the technology transfer function in Alta University. And, um, uh, we also coordinate and organize and uh, fund uh, the commercialization of Alta technology. So annually, we fund uh, commercialization projects around uh, three to four million euros, and then we help either make them into spin-out and or license. Um, yes, that's short for Ace, but I'll let Jeff introduce himself. Thank you. Jeffrey Shanks. Um, came all the way from San Francisco uh, on a couple flights earlier today. Um, so I apologize in advance if I'm slightly jet lagged. Oh, so where's my first line? A little bit of advice um, work as well. I don't do any pharmaceutical work or um, biotech, but there's a pretty decent range. Um, one, the biggest one that's not on there that I just landed a couple months ago is Facebook. I guess they're an exception to my rule that I only represent startups. Let's start with why do startups file patent applications? These are some great answers, or at least great answers that you would hear if you went and got a degree, um, an MBA, uh, if you talk to a Fortune 500 um, company, a, a CEO or CFO, these are the types of answers um, that they would give you. That this, this is why you would want to seek out a patent portfolio. All these are really bad answers for startups. To enforce uh, a patent against a competitor, this isn't going to work as a startup. And it's not going to work for a couple different reasons. One is that it takes too dang long. It takes three to five years to get an issued patent. And it also takes an enormous amount of money, something on the order of three to five million dollars to bring a lawsuit. We're hearing about the Apple and Samsung patent wars. These companies have billions of dollars to fight this thing out. This is the sport of kings. Um, patent infringement lawsuit, there isn't any type of lawsuit that's more expensive. You know it's a, an, right, an area that's ripe um, to making tons of money and is super expensive when you have private equity firms investing in uh, patent infringement lawsuits. And that's exactly what's happening in the United States. Background of who I am, um, I wrote my first patent application 15 years ago. I've written five or six hundred since. Started off at a big firm, big law firm, um, for the first five or six years um, training there. And then I broke off and started my own. I've been now with my own law firm for 10 years. And what we do is we represent startups. Um, I work and live in the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, startups is what we do. This is what we live and breathe. In addition to representing startups, um, I also teach. I teach a class uh, at Stanford. Um, in the mechanical engineering department. Uh, it's cross-listed over in the D school and also in uh, ms &E. And that class is uh, patent strategy uh, for um, innovators and entrepreneurs. I also teach a class over at uh, Stanford Law School. I've also taught at Stanford, or uh, University of Michigan in the College of Engineering there. I've written a book, a bunch of blogs, a bunch of other things. But what I'm here today is to tell you about 
what startups need to know about patent law? It's just a tiny sampling of the clients that I have. Um, who here has heard of Twilio? A couple. Um, and there's Massive Health. Um, Tactus has gotten a lot of great press recently. Um, so companies, um, typically in my background, uh, my background's in both mechanical and electrical and software, and so the companies that I represent are either kind of pure software plays, like platforms, like Twilio, um, big cloud, big data in the cloud, um, but I also swing all the way to clean tech stuff and also to med device.